normally don't like to do this. I don't like to interrupt the flow of the worship, but I really feel in my spirit right now, there's a quickening that needs to happen. We're singing this song. This is a very powerful song because we're declaring the name of Jesus and everything must bow to the name of Jesus. And I feel the Holy Spirit quicken me today to instruct us in this. When we sing this song again, we each have people in our lives that are held in bondage. We each have people in our lives that are being captive by the darkness. And right now, when we sing this song, don't just sing this song. Don't just sing this song, but use this as a to pro prophesy, to declare over people in your life that are held in bondage. You begin to speak the name over them specifically while we sing this song. Like, Michaela, I speak the name of Jesus over you. Erica, I speak the name of Jesus over you. Come forth. This is what the Holy Spirit is quickening us to do right now. This is the time of war. This is the time of doing the fight on their behalf. In Jesus' name.
seems to be a great preoccupation with Jesus in this room this morning, and rightly so. Come on, let's applaud Jesus again. Give him glory. Glory. Give him praise. Amen. I want you to go ahead and be seated. For most of us here today, the journey with Jesus began as a revelation of God's love to us. And it started with what we know as conversion, being born again, getting saved. There's many different ways to describe how this journey began. But I want you to understand something this morning. It didn't begin with your revelation began way, way before that. You see, this love story started in the heart of the Father because God in his foreknowledge knew that after he created the human race, the human race would reject him and fall into sin. So the Father had to create a plan, and he did, a perfect plan. And that plan included his son, Jesus, who would come. And he would give himself freely as a sacrifice for our redemption. That plan began in Bethlehem. You can't separate the manger scene from Calvary. By the way, these two locations are inside of five miles apart. I find that very interesting. That Father God would permit his son to be born in a manger and then less than five miles away. That would be like from downtown Aberdeen to downtown Hoquiam. Jesus would die on the cross for the remission of our sins. But it doesn't end there. Because inside of two miles of Jerusalem is a place called the Mount of Olives. And that's where Jesus ascended to heaven. There's a lot going on around that place. But it doesn't stop there either. The Bible does say that when Jesus returns, he will put his foot on the Mount of Olives and it'll split in half. This is a big story, church, and you're very much a part of it. When you responded to the love of God by receiving Jesus as your Savior. And we get to celebrate all through the month of December and beyond into 2024 this amazing love story of God. But I want you to take a look at this. The manger, Calvary, is the 33-year period of God's love unfolding through a person. And the person is Jesus, who gave himself freely. And you hold in your hand a packet, a little small packet. This little packet has a wafer it has some juice. I'm almost embarrassed to offer you this packet. Because how many understand within it is a summary of the life of God's love for us. A body broken, blood shed. And we've reduced it to this. But if it was just about this, we'd miss the mark. But I want you to open your eyes of revelation today. Because beyond the literal bread and juice is a life given 
expression of love. The Bible does say that Jesus willfully gave himself. Where does it say that? Well, he wrestled in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, not my will, but thine be done. So he gave his body as a sacrifice. From that moment on, blood was shed all over the place. Jesus was arrested. He was taken into the courtroom. He was beat upon and the bloodbath began. A crown of thorns put on his head all the way through to the spear being put in Jesus' side and outflowed both blood and water. It's an amazing love story. Don't take it tritely. Don't take it matter-of-factly because it's God's love poured out for you. So, if you would, take the wafer that's in the packet first time I saw Mel Gibson's portrayal of Jesus' crucifixion, it just astounded me because I had read time and time again that the crucifixion of Jesus was so great that Jesus was unrecognizable. Well, I can see that through the Mel Gibson portrayal. Talk about love demonstrated. Jesus sacrificed his body for the forgiveness of our sins. Take this much bread and let's eat it together, thanking God for his amazing love toward us. caught a revelation of this and he writes in the book of Hebrews without the shedding of blood there is no remission no remission for our sin Paul's revelation started on a Damascus road journey where he encountered Jesus personally from there on out he was ruined he couldn't go back to his life as a Pharisee, as a nominal Jew, but he became radical for the kingdom. It wasn't just the flip of the switch in his life. It was a miraculous transformation of his life just like you have because Jesus took your sins away and I want you to thank him by drinking this cup together with me and recognize that you are blood washed blood bought you're not your own Jesus paid the ultimate price let's drink together I reference the fact that Jesus would be returning to a piece of real estate just outside of Jerusalem proper. When he comes back, he's not coming back as a savior. He's coming back as a king. His kingship is already in force and you're going to see complete fulfillment of what that looks like. Because I have a sneaky suspicion 
you will lay ice on all of that whole thing going on. And what a way to live your life. I want to encourage you just to invest in the kingdom. Invest your life in this man, Jesus, who is in fact the son of the living God. You'll never go wrong by that. Amen? God bless you. And so we live our lives out here on the planet sharing this message in Grays Harbor to our family, to our friends. And we want to do our very best to not compromise, but to lay it all out for what it is. Not only in Grays Harbor, in the state of Washington, but in regions beyond. We've been giving you the opportunity to invest in other places for the furtherance of the gospel. Simone shared a few weeks ago about lives changed in northern India and Nepal. Bridge of Love Ministries is reaching girls, young, young girls, out of human trafficking, and that is a major miracle. Simone shared that a few weeks back. Rescue Ministries International is doing an admirable thing in Sierra Leone. They're rescuing blind children off the streets because they're castaways. And what we want to do this Christmas season is invest in these children. And so we have a Christmas tree on the in the hallway with balls on those Christmas tree actually paper balls you can take uh, a ball which has Rescue Ministries International on it or Bridge of Love put some money in there put it in that offering box in the hallway if you want credit for giving just write your name on the back side of that um, Christmas ball and we will credit you with these monies will go to the children of these two ministries. I want Lindsay to come forward. Lindsay will share a little bit about what is happening when it comes to Rescue Ministries International and these children in Sierra Leone. Good morning. We have um, an orphanage of 52 blind children and uh, we've had them for, some of them we've had for about 15 years. And there, as Pastor Lee mentioned, in Africa and a lot of parts of the world, if you, are, if you can't see or if you have some kind of disability, then you're rejected from your community. And so uh, when I was there, we, we, my husband found them and we started this ministry through that. And they have an orphanage that they live in. There are schools provided for them, their housing. They go to church over there, and we provide for all their needs. So every year, we uh, have a white Christmas celebration. They named it that. They call it White Christmas because they say that the white people eat a lot in America, and they also want to eat a lot in Africa. <laughs> so we have a big celebration where we rent a um, huge sound system, and they dance the whole day, and they eat lots and lots of food, and they, have, they get uh, outfits and shoes. Great. Thank you, Lindsay. What we're going to do is we're going to do this for the next couple weeks. Take a ball off the tree. You can give to Bridge of Love. You can give to Rescue Ministries International. And let's invest in these little children. Some of them are little, some of them are older. And see to it that they have a blessed time of the year. It's all about giving. God gave so that... You give so that. And we follow that pattern, and that's, I believe, a godly pattern. And so take the time. Visit that Christmas tree. Take not only one, but two, three balls. Start giving, and let the Spirit of God direct you 
accordingly. Okay? Across the hallway from that Christmas tree, you'll see there's a display table. Um, Allah over here is making provision, crepes that you can place orders for if you have a Christmas holiday function that you're having in your family or maybe a business event that you need to bring something for, it would be good if you utilize those opportunities to give. So you can place orders. You can do so by texting or actually placing the order there at the table. And by the way, I want to say there are three major samples and those are freebies. You can sample and sample and sample until you can't resist anymore. And you say, I got to have some of those. So just note that and be a participant in that as well. I just want to say also, we have two major Christmas events yet to unfold. Last Friday night, we had an amazing time in our annual Christmas church Christmas party as we celebrated the goodness of Jesus with one another. We ate, we laughed, we had fun. We actually sang and we heard great music. It was a wonderful time of being together. So I want to say thank you to everybody that participated and what a team we had putting together that event. On the 17th of this month, that's a Sunday at Help me with the time, Sharon. Five o'clock in the afternoon is our children's Christmas presentation. And we will have this room filled with grandparents, uh, relatives of the children, and uh, they're going to be sharing the Christmas story. And it is always fun. But by the way, at the end of it, we'll also have food, fellowship, which we always enjoy doing so it's going to be a great event there as well and then our third and final major event for this year will be december the 24th our sunday morning service will be our annual candlelight service and it's a great opportunity for you to bring a friend and a neighbor a relative to experience christmas with you this year so those are some of the things happening in the next several weeks. We want to encourage you to give. Slides coming up here to share with you the giving opportunities here at Cornerstone Church, which are in fact many uh, opportunities, four to be exact. You can give today, you can give by mailing in your gifts. You can actually give online or text in your giving. We greatly appreciate your faithfulness as we close out this year, God has done some amazing things for us, miraculously, financially. And so I just want to encourage you to continue to participate in the giving opportunities that are before us as a people. I want you to take your Bibles this morning. For the next couple weeks or more, I want to talk to you about the subject of peace. We have a sign up on this side of the sanctuary that says, Peace on Earth. We sang about it earlier in the service that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I'm going to get to that somehow, some way this morning, trust me. But I want you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, and I want to begin by this passage of scripture and then we'll comment on it as we get going further in the service. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 8 English Standard Version goes like this. Finally brothers, how about if we insert sisters there as well? Do we have a sister in the house? How many brothers do we have in the house? Two brothers, three brothers, you're getting lazy on me here. Come on, brothers. Come on, let's use this. Sisters. Uh, okay. I didn't make up these phrases, church. They're not on me. When we read the scriptures, we see inserted in scriptures um, 
the fact that we have brothers and sisters in the faith. Why is that? Because we're a family. We're part of God's family. And when you connect with Jesus, our elder brother, we have extended family called brothers and sisters in the faith. So that's where we get this from. Look at this passage. Finally, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, long list of stuff, and then Paul adds these four words. Think about these things. Think about these things. Today we, we engaged in the communion or the Lord's Supper this amazing covenant meal. And without an exhaustive review of what the bread and cup mean, I think the underlying message is that Jesus Christ paid for our sins completely. He did. And there's nothing you can add to assure or complete your salvation. Jesus did it all. That being said, you must choose Christ. I, I have to say this because there's such conf confusion out there in the Christian community and the community at large. You have to accept Jesus. You need to choose him. It's not automatic. It's not about what family you were born into or what church you attend. That doesn't automatically make you a Christian. Starting point, ground zero, is when you personally respond to the love of God. The Bible makes it clear that salvation is a free gift to anyone who applies the work of Calvary to their lives. Whereas salvation is free. Listen to me very carefully because this is where I want to launch this message. Whereas salvation is free, you have to fight for your peace. Did you get that? Every day, negative, hurtful, and harmful thoughts have the ability to plague your mind. I don't have to tell you that. You already know that. See, you don't wake up in the morning and think, well, I'm going to have an awful day today. Or I'll dig up the worst, most terrible, painful things to think about. It doesn't work that way. You know that. Bad thoughts just come on their own. By the way, there's an author for that. And I don't want to give him credit for that this morning. But he's at work. Because... There you are in the middle of your day. You're just doing your own thing when all of a sudden a negative thought invades your mind. And then you say, where did that come from? You didn't plan on it or even want to think that thought. You might have even thought that you were past that already in your life. But out of nowhere, it shows up to haunt you again. Why? Because bad thoughts bombard us. And we have to fight 
for our peace. We need to become disciplined in conscientiously choosing our thoughts. I just told you something powerful. <laughs> Did you get it? Bad thoughts come on their own. Good thoughts have to be chosen, selected, embraced, and pursued. Simply put, they have to be fought for. Big question is, how hard are you fighting for your peace? So, out with the bad and in with the good. That's what I want to talk to you about. Out with the bad and in with the good. When you hear about peace all throughout this season and in these next weeks, I want you to choose the pathway of peace. You're going to have plenty of opposition or distractions that would want to lead you in another direction. So, in with the good, out with the unresolved conflict, Negativity, ungratefulness, dividing cares. Your past hurts. You may be carrying a boatload of past hurts in your life today. Disappointments, anxieties. Out with that kind of thinking completely. But after you've emptied the trash can, What are you going to fill your mind with? That's where you're going to fight for peace. Paul, the apostle, in the book of Philippians, he gives us eight categories to pay attention to. We're talking about peace now. We're talking about Jesus, the Prince of Peace. We're talking about a season filled with peace. And you can look around, all around you, and you can see that we're living in a chaotic time where there's wars and rumors of wars. But how can you walk in measurable peace in your life? It is not a contradiction. It's a choice that you make. Out with the bad, in with the good. Paul gives us eight categories. I want you to listen to me this morning because if you get this, you're going to be on a pathway of wholeness that God has intended for you so that you don't get yourself all snarled up in the enemy's devices. Eight categories. Whatever is true, Paul said, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So in with the good. Let's figure it out. The first thing is true thoughts. In each of these, I'm going to pose a question. Ask yourself, ask yourself, when something comes at you, is this factually true? How many know the enemy is the father of lies? And when something comes your way, is it factually true? So what you need to start doing is preach to yourself constantly and tell yourself how you're going to view a matter. And you've got to start viewing it objectively, not out of your self-subjective viewpoint, but objectively. Is there any substance to this? 
That is how to handle something, what to do with it, why it matters or why it doesn't matter, and how to respond. Dwell on it to determine the true thoughts on a matter. Number one. Number two, ask yourself about honorable thoughts. Is this the highest possible opinion? Honorable thoughts. Honorable means worthy of respect. I, uh, I don't know if our present modern-day culture is living in any reality of respect. Which is, how do you think about others? Your family, co-workers, people who are... Um, maybe not like you, those who may have hurt you. I want to say this about honorable thoughts. They're neither foolish nor naive. Sometimes we think we've got to fall over and be less than um, mindful about life. They are seeing the potential for God to change other people. So when you view people, what are the honorable thoughts that go through your mind? Remember, dishonorable thoughts are the lowest op uh, opinion of a person. Can you think when you see someone that God may have some value on that person? They're they are very important. I'll tell you why. If you are thinking dishonorable thoughts, it's going to rob you of your peace. Peace will dissipate from you when you have dishonorable thoughts, impure thoughts, true thoughts that are accurate. Number three, I'm going to keep going through this rather quickly here. Just thoughts. Ask yourself, is this the right thing to do? You see, just means righteous. Peace, let me tell you, is forfeited or given up when we contemplate doing wrong. So, when you consciously want to get even with somebody or lay on the horn when somebody cuts you off, you want to set the record straight. If you entertain thoughts about doing wrong because of a wrong done to you, what happens is your peace goes out the window. And we're talking this morning about how to live and walk in full peace. Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Number four, pure thoughts. Let me deal with this. This is an important matter. Ask yourself, is this morally faithful? Peace is lost in a dirty mind. Lovely is that which attracts through its acceptable and pleasing quality. Let me explain that. Cultivate the vision to see past the outward, perishable shells of the people around you. In other words, seeing other Christians, believers, as the Bible teaches us to do, that is seeing them through Christ. How many know we, we live in a rather imperfect world? 
and all of us are imperfect at best. I'm trying to pick out my illustrations here this morning. So I'm going to pick on Anne because she's near God, okay? <laughs> she prays a lot. We respect her. But the more I hang around Anne, the real more I recognize she's just a she's just a sinner saved by grace. And my my uh, my natural inclination there would be to start losing respect for her because now all of a sudden I start seeing her faults. Okay. You do that to everybody else, so I'm just using her as an example. So what I'm saying by this is I've got to start thinking differently. I've got to start seeing Anne for Christ in her. Christ in her. And I'm going to start treating her like Christ in her, Jesus in her. So, I look over here and I see Leonard, my friend. The more I get to know Leonard, the more I realize he is pretty human, just like me. And he makes a few mistakes. Doesn't he make a few mistakes? My point is this, is that even though he does make his share of mistakes, I'm not going to hold that against him because he's a brother in Christ. The optimum phrase is in Christ. And the Bible teaches us that we're to behold others in Christ. We have to be quick to overlook these faults that we all have and see the potential of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we don't fixate on how to get even and how to set the record straight because if we fixate on that, we lose our peace. It's up to you, church. Do you want to lose your peace? Or do you want to walk in peace? Pure thoughts. Pure thoughts. Number four. Ask yourself, is this morally faithful? I think I've been on this. Peace is lost in a dirty mind. I said that. Pure primarily, if we want to look at it from a biblical perspective, refers to sexual propriety consistent with God's design for a healthy sexual life. One man with one woman for life. We're living in a twisted culture, church. You're going to have to figure this out according to the Bible. Anything in your mind outside of God's design that is places to go, websites to visit, pictures to view, flirtation to entertain, these are in your own ruin. Because when you dwell on that stuff, peace goes out the window. You got to fight for your peace. Salvation is free. Peace you've got to work for. Paul said to dwell on lovely thoughts. So ask yourself, is this attractive? Lovely is that which attracts through its acceptable and pleasing quality. Focus. 
on the growing, increasing beauty of Christ within. Guests are seeing things from a different perspective. The beauty of enduring love. Peace will flee if we are caught in fault finding. Peace feeds and focuses upon true beauty in our life. Let me give you the sixth one that Paul offers us is commendable thoughts. Commendable thoughts. So ask yourself, is this friendly? The word commendable is translated in the New King James Version as whatever is of good report. It refers to kindness. It is the concept of friendliness. So these are the thoughts. Ask yourself, are these the thoughts of a true friend? The next is excellent thoughts. Ask yourself, is this majority thinking? Ask yourself, is this ascribing to excellence? Because excellence refers to virtue. It's that which the human race consistently regards as good. So, if those in your family, if those in your church family would come together and recommend something to you as good and virtuous, would you be able to recognize it? Think on these things. And the last one, praiseworthy thoughts. Ask yourself, is this vertical? I have to ask myself this all the time. Is this vertical? Does this thought honor God? The thought going through my mind, is it honoring to God? Do you actually think about these things, church? Does, does your mind process this stuff? Or do you just go and do what you want to do? You've got to realize that there's a God in heaven watching you. Does this thought honor God? Does it fuel worship or elevate his name in your life? I think that's a way that we want to live our lives. Focusing our thoughts on, on praiseworthy things, such as God's word, such as God's son, and such as God's people. So after giving us eight categories of good thoughts to fill our minds with, Paul says this, four words, think on these things. Because if we think on the good things, it's going to fuel peace in our life. If we give ourselves to the negative end, peace will escape your life. Question I want to ask you this morning is what level of peace are you walking in today, December 3rd, 2023? Say, well, I'm not in much peace. I, my life is a turmoil. Whoa. Let's examine what's getting into your head. Because what gets into your head will eventually get to your heart. How many know this 12 inches from here to here is a very important pathway? It's more important to you than I-5 or whatever road you take to get to town. This 12 inches is significantly important because peace is not passivity. 
You've got to fight for your peace. And if you go slack on yourself, I'm here to tell you, a lot of bad stuff can take place. Peace. With peace and thoughts that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy, we do this. We dwell on these things because the battle for our mind rages today and every day. So daily, out with the bad and in with the good. Right? Could you stand with me? I hope I've been able to give you something that you can practically walk in. See, peace isn't like a cloud floating over you and all of a sudden it dumps on you. Peace doesn't work like that. Peace is something you fight for. You exclude certain things in your life because when you allow these certain things in your life, it zaps every particle of peace that you have. But when you walk in peace, doing what God said in his word you eliminate unnecessary turmoil in your life how many are a candidate right now for less turmoil in your life I certainly am Paul gives us a way to walk in peace so I want you to fight for peace I'm going to ask that you put your hand on your heart. I'm going to ask that you put your hand on your head. Because that's where it's going to start. The battle for your mind. Father God, tonight, today we, we stand in this room aware that Paul, the apostle of old, whom we read of today and we accept his words as written words from you, he says, if we will do these things, we will have peace in our life. So we fight for peace today. We thank you that you have redeemed us by the blood, by the sacrifice given on Calvary that revelation has come to us now we want to live in victory victory over the dictates of the enemy the negative stuff the bad thoughts that come our way through the mind gate and we're asking Lord that we will be able to negotiate the pathway of righteousness by making correct choices when we're bombarded we're flooded with negativity and the enemy's devices. And so today we're praying that you protect our minds from the evil one. And that throughout this season, we'll be able to practically apply your peace because you came to be the Prince of Peace and to give us peace. We apply that to our life. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next Sunday, I'm going to tap into another area of peace. This is, is a time frame that the enemy many times wants to flip us upside down and bring a lot of despair into our life. 
but we've been called to walk in peace. Amen? So let's just open our hearts to the full measure of peace that God has. Our prayer team is here to pray with you. If you're struggling with things, feel free to come and receive ministry. I want you, before you leave, and pick up your kids to sample some of those grapes out there and begin to do some of your shopping right here. God has been good to us, church, and we want to avail ourselves to the full measure of what he has for us. These prayer people want to pray with you and for you to help you get through some knot holes and bring to you the full measure that God has for you. Peace that passes all understanding. God bless you. Go in grace, the grace of the Lord. Have a great day.